Hello everyone and welcome to the first of our three-part series covering DCS for the uninitiated. Today we're going to address the first question anyone ever asks. What is DCS? As I mentioned, this is a three-part series and after we look at what DCS is, we're going to talk about how to get started and also where to go. Hit that subscribe button and make sure you don't miss out on those because you're also not going to want to miss out on the DCS giveaway that's launching now. Digital Combat Simulator, commonly referred to as DCS, is a PC flight simulation software. I hesitate to say game here because most DCS players rightfully refer to this as a hobby, not a game. It sits in the gray area between a hobby like rebuilding a 1950s Pontiac and a very complicated board game converted for the computer. To grasp all this, we're going to have to look at the spectrum of video games that involve the player flying an aircraft. On the game end of the spectrum, you have arcade-style games like World of Warplanes and War Thunder. These games are dogfighting games, but they don't incorporate any degree of realistic flight model or constraint. They're an absolute blast, and while you might find some success with real tactics, the path to victory is just good arcade gameplay. Close to this are games that include flying, like Modern Warfare or Call of Duty. On the other end of the spectrum is full-fledged flight simulators. There are no points, no objectives, and if you spend your time doing this, at the end of the day it's because you enjoy imagining you're actually flying that 747 from Heathrow to JFK. Flight simulators are impressive in their full modeling of flight characteristics and model. The full suite of avionics has been modeled, and unlike War of Thunder, where W makes you go forward, you better know what all the buttons on that flight deck do, because you're gonna need most of them to move forward. DCS does not sit in the middle of this spectrum. In fact, Eagle Dynamics, the developer, is working on modern air combat, or MAC, which does aim for the center. DCS, rather, sits with the simulators, requiring, for example, a knowledge of all those buttons and, yes, you will put that F-14 into a flat spin like Maverick. Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 allows you to fly anywhere in the world and is tied to Bing Maps for terrain and weather. And it looks stunning. So why not just fly that if you want to hit all the buttons? Well, Microsoft won't let you drop bombs. DCS is a combat simulator. It's in the name. Combat by definition is competition, and competition, thus, a game. DCS gives you the option to fly a surprisingly large number of early and current generation fighters while learning how to operate their fully modeled systems while trying to shoot down your friends or perfect strangers. DCS is often referred to as a study sim. This isn't the sort of game you pick up on a Saturday morning and by the afternoon you're pawning noobs. A year after you start your first full module, you'll probably still be pulling up guides and manuals. Let's dive into that a little more in a moment, but first, a little background. DCS refers to their aircraft as modules. This is because you purchase each aircraft individually, and they're modular. These modules come in three flavors, supporting modules, basic flight model modules, and professional flight model modules. Supporting modules are things like the brand new supercarrier, which, if purchased, allows the player to use carrier-borne aircraft and launch or land them on deck but it also utilizes many functions like the airboss, catapult operator, landing officer, and so on. Other examples are maps. DCS comes free with the Caucasus map over present-day Georgia. In addition to this are the Nevada Test and Training Range, which covers Vegas, Area 51, and so forth. There's also the Persian Gulf map, which is quite popular, and Normandy for the World War II aviation fans. You can fly modern aircraft there, but the runways are all very short, so you'll need perfect landings or a biggin. In development are a Marianas Islands map, which has plenty of water for that supercarrier, a Falklands map, and continuing work on the channel map, which features more of southern England than the Normandy one. All are confirmed, but there is also a Syria map that everyone is very excited about that isn't officially confirmed, but should be coming, and rumors also exist of a Baltic map. Okay, so let's now talk about those two types of flight models. All aircraft modules in DCS have the following things in common. One, you must know how to actually fly them. There's no generic flight model. The MiG-29 flies like a MiG-29, the F-16 flies like an F-16, and the F-15 flies like a... well, you get it. 
They all have a great deal of programming behind them, and they do act and are constrained just like their real-world counterparts. If they are not fly-by-wire, you're going to have to use rudder, aileron, and stabilizer movements to maneuver. 2. You must know how to use their avionics suite. If this term is new to you, it simply means you must actually use all the controls of the aircraft to operate. If you want to drop bombs in the F-16, you must select air-to-ground master mode on the ICP. You must determine the method of drop, select the weapons, and so on. You don't just lock onto an enemy fighter by clicking on their icon or moving a cursor over them like in some other video games. Rather, you must properly operate the radar system just like you would on the real aircraft. Now, this isn't just to suggest that you can't just put an enemy fighter in a certain part of the HUD and get it to lock on in some aircraft in a dogfight mode. I know I'm going to get sharp shot on this example, but it's an example. There is no game autopilot. If the aircraft has an autopilot, you'll have to operate it like the real one. Now, yes, the Viggen has a mode that practically lands itself, but the real one does too. Yes, the F-14 can land itself on the carrier, but only if you properly set it up to do so. In DCS, you have to take off in the correct fashion, you have to land in the correct fashion, let alone properly navigate. All feature real weapons loadouts. The F-14 does not get AIM-120Cs. The F-16 doesn't get the R-75, so on and so forth. This is true of systems. The MiG-29, F-18, and F-16 all offer their own brand of helmet-mounted queuing overlay. The others don't. 5. All feature replicated cockpits in their native languages, though many offer versions in other languages where they were operated or in English. If not, usually there's a player-made mod that can be used to get it into English for those of you that don't speak those other languages. From here, it's fairly easy to explain them what the professional flight model is. PFM modules feature fully modeled systems and cockpits, as well as much more accurate flight models. As previously mentioned, if you get asymmetrical thrust from one of the engines on the F-14, it will go into a flat spin. This isn't just because Top Gun featured it either. All of the other weird little quirks of the F-14 exist. Almost every switch works in the cockpit of a PFM module. Generally, the only ones that don't are things like cabin climate controls. Though if you leave the canopy open on a Viggen long enough in freezing weather, your pilot does shiver and get hypothermia. The full avionics systems are replicated. While other video games might let you hit an MFD button to go into a bombing mode, as previously mentioned in the F-16, you'll have to select all of the factors in the proper order. On the Viggen, the CK-37 computer is fully modeled, meaning you will have to learn all the different numeric codes that are entered into the computer and what states to send commands to it. The modeling is so accurate on PFM aircraft that, in the Viggen for example, you run into problems on the Nevada map because like computers in the 1990s, Saab never designed the computer to work west of the prime meridian, so you cannot enter westerly coordinates as you would need to on the Nevada map. The real one can't, so it can't in DCS either. While I won't go so far as to say if you can fly it in DCS, you can fly it in real life, DCS does actually market in the defense industry and there are some countries that use DCS simulation to train actual fighter pilots on some of these systems. If you can start up a Block 50 F-16C in DCS, you'll be able to do so in the real one. This is why this is a study simulator. You're not going to just jump in and know how to do it all after a few hours. Our next video covers how to get started, so I won't take up valuable time here, but to say that most serious DCS pilots learn one aircraft at a time if not just one ever. A friend of mine has over 200 hours in the F-16 module at this point, is competent enough to operate the module in game at a level expected of a new pilot in a real squadron. I'm not saying you can't do it in less, or that it won't take more, but that it is a lot of work. Before moving on to the basic flight model modules, we should take a moment to talk about early access. Most of the current generation, really fourth generation, Modules are an early access. This is a major point of contention in forums and in the player base. The F-16C Block 50 Viper is an early access. Our DED and MFDs do not have a cruise page. We don't have an air-to-ground radar, nor do we have harmed missiles. Yes, the store page mentions these things, but they're not yet in game. The A-10, on the other hand, is completed. Everything works. If it can carry it on those stubs it calls wings, it can in DCS. The Viggen is another example of a completed module. 
It can take years for these modules to be completed, and there's a great deal of salt around that. This is a topic for another day, but the final point here to make before moving on is third-party developers. ED is not a major studio, and each PFM module takes millions of man-hours of development. This is where third-party developers enter the picture. Heapler, for example, makes the Vigan and F14. Decca Ironworks makes the JF17. Razbam, the Harrier. This is not a complete list, but Eagle Dynamics, in addition to their own releases like the F18, has contracts with different developers who build modules for their system and sell them through their webpage. Each of these has their strengths and weaknesses. The product is not uniform developer to developer, which is a consideration when deciding what to buy. So if a professional flight model module is fully modeled, what does that mean for basic flight model modules? Well, the name asserts the core difference out the gate. While asymmetrical thrust on the F-14 will create a stall specific to the layout of the engines on the F-14, the MiG-29, a BFM module, doesn't have such a thing modeled. The general flight characteristics are all modeled, but not with the same precision that a PFM module has. One critical thing to understand here is this. No BFM modules have been developed in the last two years. These are really remnants of a past era of DCS, and are hallmarks of a DCS attempt to fit more in that central gaming market. The most noticeable thing that a player will find in a BFM module, because unless you flew the real version, the reduction in flight miles probably not going to be noticed, are its controls. BFM cockpits are fully replicated, but not fully modeled. I'd normally flip these terms around, but the M in BFM is modeled. On Russian jets, you select your bomb interval with a rotating knob. You'll have to use the keyboard command. BFM modules are, in my opinion, much harder to use for this reason. DCS requires you to set all the settings, and once you understand how virtually every Air Force in the world solved these problems and set up their systems, you'll see that a PFM module is actually easier to use. Generically speaking, a bombing run requires you to select the weapon, select the release type and quantity, set the spacing if more than one is to be released, and then often requires you to select a fuse setting. In the F-16, this is very easy. It's all done through the MFD buttons, and the screen kind of prompts you. On the MiG-29, the steps are identical, but the controls are not modeled in the cockpit. You can see the knobs, but they don't do anything. So you must remember four to five different keyboard shortcuts, all containing multiple keys, to perform them in order to do your release. The horrible irony here is the MiG-29 was designed for a conscript to fly, and the avionics system is exponentially easier to use in real life, but exponentially harder in DCS, because you can't just turn the knob and flip the switches. So why play DCS? You have to spend a year learning it, it's hard, you have to remember a lot. In fact, if you've made it this far, you're probably waiting for me to tell you why you should want to get into DCS at all. You are either one of two people when it comes to DCS. You are either a former or current pilot, in which DCS lets you continue that love and I don't have to say anything further. Or you're like myself, not a pilot. I came to DCS with a handful of flight simulator games in my past, but I'm no real pilot, and I didn't even serve in a branch of the US military that has fixed wing aircraft, though I've watched them drop plenty of ordnance. DCS is a challenge. The immediate learning curve is intense, but when you get it, the first time you start up the jet without a tutorial guiding you, there is a sense of accomplishment that rivals being on the winning team in a World of Warships match. The first time you land your aircraft without smashing it into the ground is an accomplishment that will make winner winner chicken dinner seem dull by comparison. It will change your life. The next time you fly for vacation, you'll notice the 737 making the same turns and all those strange sounds the aircraft makes. It'll make all perfect sense to you. Here's what makes DCS even more unique though, and what makes DCS one of the best gaming experiences you could have. The other players. There's not another game out there that you can jump into an F-14, get into a server and fly formation with a former US Navy Top Gun instructor. Remember that first group I mentioned? DCS is where some of military aviation's legends hang out in retirement. In DCS, you're going to have the chance to fly with guys who did it for real from around the world, and they're going to welcome you into this brotherhood so long as you come with good attitude and willingness to learn. There is an aviation joke in there. DCS opens the door to a world that most of us would never experience in real life for a variety of reasons. 
Beyond the complications of actually learning to fly a military aircraft from the second generation of flight to the fourth, is an incredible player base that is more tight-knit than any other gaming community. That remarkable satisfaction from learning something new and challenging, and a unique way to have fun doing something that most people cannot. Best of all, I'll be giving away a professional flight model module as part of this series. In our next video, we'll discuss how to get started in DCS, and in the video that follows, we'll look at what you could call end-game content at the unique and amazing world of virtual squadrons and real-world operations. I'll cover these specifics of the giveaway next week as well, but to win, all you're going to have to do is be subscribed to this channel and comment on any video published on this channel until the close of the contest. As always, don't forget to like and share this video, subscribe if you haven't, and I will catch you all next time.